Happy Sabbath to everyone. Oh, so lovely to see you here. We want to welcome you, everyone, imagine, in the house of your father. Welcome everyone. I know there are some people who are visiting with us for probably the first time or the second time or but who are not members, we want to invite them to show by their hands that they are here with us so that we can say thank you to the Lord. Please indicate it by showing your hand. Thank you very much. Could you keep your hands up? I want to invite the deacons to come and give them some gifts. Please keep up your hands up. Keep your hands up. Uh, while the deacons are doing some good services, I wish to pass to you some announcements for the interest of time. First announcement, I want to remind you that the Lord God is precious with us and COVID is reducing time after time. Now, the area for masking and distancing will be up in the balcony. Here you'll be free, starting from next Sabbath. I thank God for that. And also I want to remind that the people who attend, everyone is supposed to attend the Bible class with Pastor David. It's at four every Sabbath, including today. And the topic is an interesting one. Ellen G. White and her sources. Her sources, please come. Pastor David has a secret to reveal to you about her sources. Uh, the uh, another announcement is next Sabbath we have a Holy Communion. A Holy Communion that will take place here. There will be not only Lord's Supper but also the foot washing. Please come one and come everyone so that we celebrate that foot washing. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I bring you greetings from Coralwood Adventist Academy School Board, the staff, and our school body. As I look out, I see many familiar faces, and forgive me, I don't remember all the names, but I see some students. I see all my current students, and it brings me joy. Pastor Hamster gave me five minutes to share with you. I thought to myself, how do I share 21 years uh, being at Coralwood in five minutes. And then the acronym FAMILY came to me, so I can update you on Coralwood. F is for truly family. We currently sit at 126 students, eight teachers, two teacher aides, one librarian, one chaplain, and Ms. Laura and I are in the office. And each morning, our staff gather in the library for family worship. And as we start our day with prayer, we are seeing how God is working in our school in a mighty way. Greeting our students at the front door, learning their names, demonstrates to our families that they are important to us. They are family. Our kids stand up for one another like families do. A couple weeks ago, this demonstration of family was seen in the halls, and I have to share. A little grade two girl was crying rather loudly in the hallway because she couldn't open her water bottle. A grade nine boy came upstairs and he stopped and said, what are you crying about? She said, I can't open my water bottle. He said, here, and he did it for her. He says, now stop crying and get back to class. It was the funniest thing to watch, but that's what families do is we help each other. Watching our youth care for the younger is family. Interviewing new students uh, this month has provided an opportunity to invite more people into our family. And when asked why they come to Coralwood, 
They simply say, we have heard there is a family environment who cares. A, academics. A new curriculum is rolling across our teachers' desks this fall. We're grateful for the updated material because 2002 is the last time we've updated it. So 20 years later, we've got some good information coming. But we have the freedom to teach our students the concepts that we have to teach them from a biblical perspective. I'm grateful for that freedom still. Our students have graduated from Coralwood and gone on to be engineers, dentists, paramedics, nurses, and several own their own businesses. So when I hear rumors that say Coralwood doesn't provide a quality education, I say nay nay. That is so not true because our kids are being accepted into U of A, Berman, Oakwood College, and going on to Loma Linda. PAT results are coming in, and we have some strong results that our Coralwood students are thriving compared to other schools in the province. I got, I got proof. Come see me. I'll show you. Quarterly, we are administering reading tests to our students from grades 2 to 9. We're tracking their progress, and I am thrilled to tell you that our students are reading anywhere from two to five years above their grade level. Yeah, we provide quality education at Coralwood. Um, we have a partnership with our online school, PACES, for our high school program. Uh, they provide the core subjects, and we provide the options. Um, if we had more students, uh, we could offer more. But I'm going to leave that topic in God's hands. M, money. You know a school has to run, and it takes money. With our policies in place, our families are consistently paying their tuition. Two churches like you are making their contributions, and the 500K campaign that we just finished put $677 plus dollars, thousand dollars towards our debt. Praise God. Thanks to people like you who have made a substantial donation, help our school continue to provide Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist education. Our grade five sixes are running a canteen every Thursday where they're learning to buy and sell, prepare a budget and record profit. Our grade 10 comm class had an accountant come in and teach them about taxes and spending and saving. And he's actually coming back to help them start up their own individual businesses. But he left us all with a simple yet profound statement, and that is, don't spend what you don't have. Ooh, I guess I'll put my credit card away. Um, but we do have a few leaks in the roof. That huge snowfall that came just last week, droop, 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 droop. So we are um, needing to raise money for a new roof. Letter I. Sorry, David, more than five. Integration of faith and learning. I have been inside the classroom observing teachers this month, and I can say with confidence, you have some amazing teachers that you can depend on. All Alberta certified, all SDACC accredited, and they are delivering lessons with enthusiasm and vigor. And I know my junior high, they're like, don't be so energetic first thing in the morning. But it's been a good experience. It's simply integrating in faith in every subject. Science is easy. Uh, socials can be easy. But how do you integrate math? So I went into the grade one room, and they were learning about measurements, um, the metric system. And the teacher pulled in saying, I lost my space. She said, God's love for us is immeasurable. So simple, just a little seed to plant. Our TQSs, which are teacher quality standards, give us a list of requirements each lesson to provide. But at Coralwood, we can add that faith component. And our kids are learning to pray because before every before every class, before every test, before every snack even, prayer is offered. Prayer is like just naturally breathing. One day, 
I was having a low moment. And my kids know that if they're hungry, they can come see me, and I will give them all the candy I have and all the food in my, I have. And one day, three grade boys, three grade seven boys came in. They go, Miss Settlin, how you doing? And I was honest. I said, I'm having a lousy day. I said, would you pray with me? And I saw their eyes go. And one of them spoke up and said, yeah, we'll pray for you. And they did right there with me. And I said, this is integration of faith and learning. It, it's there. They blessed me. My day was amazing. L, leadership. Opportunities for Coralwood kids is happening. Our grade 10 and 11s, I am so proud of them. They coached volleyball to our younger kids as we went to the tournaments in October and November. They gave up their time to do that. Members of our choir are taking on fundraising projects, selling popcorn and donut um, from the proposal to the deposit. They come and give me an idea. I help them. I train them what it should look like. They are taking on these leadership positions so that they will become church leaders, community leaders, and leaders in their own homes as they start their own families. And why? You. If Coralwood didn't have your support, your prayers, and your children, it wouldn't be the family we are today. A, sub a substitute teacher was in last week. And she came to me at the end of the day and she said, something's different this year. And I went, oh, what? And she said, it feels like family. Please consider joining our family. Go to our website, www.coralwood.org, and register for the 2022-2022 year. Come, be a part of Coralwood family. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Headland. We want to call on worship. Shall we all pray? <clears throat> Thank you, God. Thank you for, again, your children who are here and who are always thirsty and hungry to hear your word and meet with you. So, dear Father, in your house. We pray for the blessing. Bless everyone here. Bless everyone who is worshiping from their own houses. And bless those ones on the way coming here. May your spirit be filled in all our hearts and minds. They may be our guide in this, our day-to-day -day lives. For this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to call on deacons to come forward to collect the offerings. Today, offerings will be, uh, well, get ready to give out the offering. Before they come, shall we pray for the offering? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your children who are ready to give you their tithe and offerings so that their blessing may be multiplied and they may know you more and more and at the end they meet the Lord Jesus coming to pick them to our home. Thank you Lord. I say pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please come forward deacons and we are going to be watching a video. Thank you. Why you're a church member? Now, some people belong to the church because they love their pastor's sermons. Other love the social interactions, the music, and the potlucks. And still others belong to the church because they believe that this is the right thing to do. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those reasons, but shouldn't we have less self-centered reasons for being together as the worldwide body of Christ? Jesus' reason for coming to this world was not self-centered. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Jesus also said that God sent him to save the world through him. 
And following in Jesus' footsteps, the church and its members should never lose sight of one of the main reasons why they are together, to save the world. And this means embracing a universal mission. It requires us to pray, plan, and act together as a world body to save people not only locally, but also regionally and globally. By planning and working together as the global body of Christ, we become stronger and we can go farther and faster. But where do the resources that we need to accomplish our worldwide mission come from? Now, among other things, the plan of tithe and offerings and the way those funds are distributed worldwide in an equitable way provides us with an opportunity to join Jesus in his global mission unselfishly. Now, the story is told of a pastor who refrained from educating his members about the danger of self-serving generosity and the importance of supporting the missionary endeavors of the global church family. His large and well-off congregation was known for its generosity. But instead of focusing on Jesus' worldwide commission, they were keen to invest in the regular upgrading of their church facilities. Unfortunately, sometimes this meant that they would stop returning a faithful tithe and participating in regular missionary offerings to invest almost exclusively in their local church. After some years, the conference transferred this pastor to a different and less affluent locality, and he quickly understood the consequences of the narrow vision of mission he once had. How large is our vision of God's mission? We are saved because God emptied heaven and sent Jesus to our world. Following Jesus' footsteps, the church at some point mobilized resources to send a missionary to your home country or region. With Jesus as our model, would you also like to be an instrument of love to every nation, tribe, language, and people? Each time we worship God with our tithe and promise, we have another opportunity to give globally, joining Jesus in saving the world. May we put our desires last and God first. A very good morning and a happy Sabbath. Thank you. So let's all join our voices as we uh, sing praise and worship to our Creator, Christ the King, with our heart, with our voice, before His throne rejoice, because praise is His gracious choice. Hymn number 10, Come Christians, join to sing. Christians join to sing Hallelujah, Amen. Loud praise to Christ our King. Hallelujah, Amen. Let all with heart and voice before His throne rejoice. Praise is His gracious choice. Hallelujah, Amen. Come lift your hearts on high. Hallelujah, Amen. Let praises fill the sky. Hallelujah, Amen. He is our guide and friend. His love shall never end. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise yet our Christ again. Hallelujah. Amen. Life shall not Singing forever 
that love the Lord, let's join our voices and sing hymn number 422, Marching to Zion. Marching to Zion. So we're going to sing the first verse, the chorus. Second verse is only by the women. The third verse will be immediately followed by the men. And then we sing the fourth verse together. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne and thus around the I love to tell the story, the story of Jesus, the story of his love to everyone around the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Hymn number 457, let's all rise as we sing, I love to tell the story. Tell 
In that moment of pastoral prayer, I will invite everyone who is able to kneel down with me, both here and those ones who are worshiping at home, and call God in prayer, shall we? Our God and our Father, <clears throat> the God of love, the God of mercy, and the God of all creation, we thank you. Thank you for these, your children, who have come here to worship you in this, your house of worship. They have come to meet with you. They are hungry and thirsty for your word. We want to, com to commune with you, God. But you are the Holy Father. We are not clean. We pray, dear Lord, that you wash every one of us with the sins of him or her so that we can fully commune with our Heavenly Father, so that we can fully benefit from all your blessing that you are bestowing upon each and every one of us. I want to pray, dear Lord, for the pastor who is coming to speak on your behalf to your children, to feed us with your word, that he be also empowered by your spirit, that as we hear the word, we see you in him. And dear Lord, we are all filled up. I want to pray, dear Lord, again for Sister Sosi. Sister Sosi, her health is bothering her. Our doctors haven't succeeded to treat her. She chose to come to you, her maker, her father, the one who loves her more than anyone else. And who sees how the body is functioning. That you may heal. Lord Jesus, when you're on the earth, anyone who came to you saying, if you're willing, you can make me well. You never said, go away, I'm not. You simply said, I am willing, be well. May we, may we. Mrs. Sosi, hear those wonderful words from her Savior saying, I'm willing, be well. I want to pray, dear Lord, for the 
the call of the card, the staff, students, and the board, the administration, that you bless them. They are there to preach your word. They are there to spray your gospel to children and parents alike. How can they make it, dear Lord, if they don't have your power and your blessing? Bless them. Bless the leadership. Bless the principal. Bless the pastor. Bless the staff. Bless the children and the parents. So that the harmony of your children be also marching according to your will. Bless everyone, I pray. Thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. For you always, prayer, for you always hear us. As I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Fellow church members, good afternoon. It's time to read the scripture reading. And please get your hardy copy. Don't depend on the gadgets. They may fail you sometime. Thank you. Let's read the scripture. And before we read it, our Lord prayer, Lord, thank you for giving us the word. As we open it, guide us and lead us to understand. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 3, verses 21. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. And it reads, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. God bless you.
Good morning, church. Isn't that a blessing? I love hearing them sing. I, I, them practice everything. It's just wonderful. So thank you, choir. At this time, we'd like to start our sermon with the children's story. So we'd like to invite the children to come forward, have a seat on the front row here, and we'll start with a story. All right? You better hurry. We only got uh, 22 minutes left in the service today, so we got to speed up here. You can sit on the front there, too, over there. Awesome. Boys and girls, it's so good to see you this morning. Have you guys had a good morning so far? That's kind of a trick question because it's actually good afternoon now, right? But I'm glad you've had a good morning. I hope you had a good time in Sabbath school, all right? Do you guys like stories? Raise your hand if you like stories. Awesome. Thank you. You can put your hands down. The half of you that raised your hand, you can listen to the story. Everybody else, you can listen to. That's fine. The last song that we sang in our praise time was, I love to tell the story of Jesus. And I love stories. Stories from the Bible, stories of people, especially stories that tell how people trusted and believed in Jesus and how that helped benefit others. Today's story is about a very special lady that I'm pretty certain you have never, ever heard of, all right? Her name was Kate Lindsay, Dr. Kate Lindsay. Dr. Kate Lindsay was born, just Kate, in Wisconsin in 1842. That's a long time ago. Anyone want to do the math on that? No? That's okay. I won't either. 1842, Dr. Kate Lindsay was born in a log cabin. Her parents were homesteaders. Does anyone know here what the word homesteader means? Some? Okay, you know? What's a homesteader? A homesteader is someone that is living in um, unsettled lands, America or Canada. Very good, yeah. Living in unsettled lands, often they lived in a log house or a sod house. Sawed house where you dug a hole in a hill and you put sod and grass on top and you lived in there and you're protected from the winter. That's where Dr. Kate Lindsay was born. And her parents loved her. She was the oldest of eight children. Only four survived, though. So she had a lot of work to do to help her mom. And Dr. Kate Lindsay went to school. Now, does anyone here know where Corwood Adventist Academy is? It's, it's that way, kind of that way. It's about four and a bit kilometers away, okay? Every day, Kate would walk that distance to school through the bush. Now, how many of you have to walk and worry about bears on your way to school? Anybody? No, no bears, no coyotes. Actually, there's coyotes around Corwood, right? There's a couple there. Uh, What about, um, let's see, bobcats? No, no, it's pretty safe walking to school, right? Well, Kate had to go through all the woods. And when she got there, guess what her desk was? A log. They took a log and they cut it in half. And so they could sit on one side of the flat log, just like you're sitting there on the steps. And you know what she got to write with? A stick. They took the dirt in the school and they smoothed out the floor because they didn't have pencils and and they didn't have chalk and the slate boards to write on, and they would write and learn how to do their letters in the dirt. Do you guys do that at recess in the sand? You practice your letters and your math and all of that? Uh, That is a long time ago. Kate loved to learn. And every night after the dishes were done and the meal was, was all finished, they would sit around the fire and her mom would read to her stories. And Kate heard the stories of great adventurers and people who traveled around the world. And Kate wanted to do that. And as soon as she could read, she read everything she could. She loved reading the Bible. And that became a problem for her parents when she was a teenager. Now, I think your parents would love to have the problem of you reading the Bible becoming a problem for them. Right? I think your parents would love that. Wouldn't you, parents? Right? If your kids read the Bible and that was a problem... 
Well, see, Kate's family was Presbyterians. And as Kate read the Bible, a Methodist minister came to town, and she heard what he had to say, and she read her Bible, and she said, you know what? I think he knows a little bit more of the truth. So she joined the Methodist church, and her poor parents were like, oh, no, she's becoming religious. And then it got even worse because after the Methodist preacher came, yeah, an Adventist preacher, and this guy came and he had all these charts and all these pictures with scary animals on them and all these beasts and stuff, but she listened and she studied and she listened and she studied and she read and she read as much as she could and she decided to follow Jesus and keep the Sabbath. Well, her poor parents, it took them a long time before they came around, but eventually, even her mother joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, as you can imagine, in the 1800s, if you were a girl, you didn't have a lot of opportunity in education, right? You didn't have a lot of opportunity in work, and that really bothered Kate. Kate wanted to be a nurse. You see, someone gave her a book about Florence Nightingale. Does anyone know who Florence Nightingale is? Anyone heard that? A couple people? Good, too. All right, so there's your homework. Another name you can look up, Florence Nightingale, and she was a nurse. And Kate read all about what she did, how she served others, how she helped to heal the wounded soldiers, and she said, I want to do that. There was only one problem. There was no nursing school. Can you imagine you want to go and become something, and there's no school to help you do that? So Kate had to wait, and she, she learned, and she found a program where she could learn how to help heal people using natural remedies. Because at this time, you know what the doctors were telling you? You shouldn't take a bath. Taking a bath is bad for you. Do you think taking a bath is bad for you? Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that, and I think your parents are too. <laughs> yeah, so they were giving all sorts of crazy medical advice. And Kate would read and she would study and she would read some of what Ellen White wrote and she said, this doesn't sound right to me. When she found a doctor doing things like, let's go for a walk outside. Let's open our windows. Let's enjoy the sunshine. Let's drink water. And they started to help people. In 1870, Kate did something that no other woman had done. Kate was a part of the first class of women at the University of Michigan admitted to medical school. And you know how you got into medical school in those days? You had to sit for tests, and the teacher would come, and he would ask you all these questions. And there was one man, the Greek teacher, did not like ladies in this school, and he kept her for over seven hours asking her to translate Greek passages, asking her about all these things that I don't even know and I can't even say the words, and she had to know it all. He finally had to stop because the sun went down and they couldn't see. She got into school, and her class of girls proved that not only were women just as smart as men, if not a little smarter, they were better students. Because they didn't party. They didn't go out and, and, you know, destroy things in the town. And soon all the people in the town wanted to rent their houses to them. And in fact, when Kate graduated six years later, she was valedictorian of her class. Isn't that incredible? And you know what Kate did? She went to work at Battle Creek Sanitarium. And she started the nursing program. There was no program for nurses, so you know what she did? She started a school for nurses. And Kate worked, Dr. Kate worked so hard to help all these ladies learn how to be professional, to learn how to help heal, how to help tell others about Jesus through caring for them. Throughout her entire life, Dr. Kate loved to learn. And most importantly, she wanted to help other students, and especially women learn to help others. So this afternoon, when you're at home and you're bored, you can look up Dr. Kate Lindsay and see what she did. You can look up Florence Nightingale and see what she did to help improve the lives of others. And I hope no matter what you do with your life, your life story will be about you helping others to see Jesus, just like Dr. Kate. All right, thank you, boys and girls. You can head back to your seats now. Thank you so much for coming.
excuse me. Education Sabbath, and that's why Corwood Adventist Academy is here. And because it's Education Sabbath, of course, I came with my trusty backpack that has been by my side for many, 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 many years now. <laughs> I just want to say how much I appreciate um, Pastor David giving us the opportunity to come today uh, to graciously hand over his pulpit uh, and to talk a little bit about Adventist education, why it's so important. And uh, I just, you know, I have to say thank you so much. And, and Mrs. Hetland touched on it so much. Thank you so much to this church for your unwavering support for Adventist education and for Coralwood. Um, your financial, sending your students, it, it really means a lot. Central sends the most students to Coralwood Adventist Academy, and because of that, you contribute financially the largest uh, portion. So thank you for that. Thank you as well for what you're doing downstairs in the children's program, because that is Adventist education too, isn't it? Not, right? Children's Sabbath school. Thank you for what you're doing to support uh, the kids and Sharani and, and all her great visions and dreams. And I just, you know, God's blessings on all of you and, and what, what you are doing. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm going to start at verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 12. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. How thankful I am to Christ Jesus our Lord for considering me trustworthy and appointing me to serve him. Even though I used to scoff at the name of Christ, I hunted down his people, harming them in every way I could, but God had mercy on me because I did it in my unbelief. Oh, how kind and gracious the Lord was. He filled me completely with faith and the love of Jesus Christ. For this is a true saying, and everyone should believe it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I was the worst of them all. But that is why God had mercy on me, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience, even with the worst sinners. For then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Therefore, glory and honor to God forever and ever. For he is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Every moment that we stand, whether sharing the word from the front or in front of the children in the classroom or uh, downstairs in the children's Sabbath school or greeting children and other members in the foyer or in the fellowship hall, every moment we stand there in the grace and patient mercy of a Savior. We stand there hopefully knowing that God has saved me, the worst of sinners, and we're all sinners. Let's not, let's not try and hide. Let's not make degrees here. But we stand in the grace of Jesus Christ. Adventist education is this, that the instruction your students receive, whether downstairs, whether in your home, whether at Coralwood, whether at Berman University, Loma Linda, wherever they are, they receive that instruction through the lens, through a vessel that understands and stands in that truth, that I am a sinner saved by grace, and that in me is demonstrated the patience of God that the students may learn and grow and believe. That's it. That's the sermon. <laughs> Uh, no, but, but really, that's what Adventist education is, right? Whether downstairs, in your home, or at the school. The life of a disciple is to bring honor and glory to God. That's our job. That's our purpose, following Jesus, to bring honor and glory to God. Whenever the teachers deliver the curriculum, they deliver it through this lens, 
God's grace and his patient mercy in all of our lives. I'd like to think of myself as a bit of an amateur photographer. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that. Many, many, many years later now, and around, say, 40,000 pictures or so, I've quickly learned that I am no photographer. No, no photographer. Uh, around those, I, and I'm guessing around 40,000 pictures that I've taken, um, there maybe, maybe is like three or four that I'm like, yeah, that's, that is an amazing shot. That's, that's a quality shot. And there probably is another, I don't know, five or six that could be good Ikea posters. You know, you go to Ikea and they have all those, those big, you know, pictures there. And yeah, that's kind of a neat picture. Nothing really special, looks, looks kind of cool, you know. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time, and as I was gathering up some cameras, I realized I've spent a little bit of money uh, <laughs> on that, and that's where the backpack comes in handy, all right? Um, let's see here. We've got this. This is the first camera that I received, I remember. I, I believe it was a Christmas present. The only Christmas present I got that year. I'm just kidding. And uh, I was so excited to have this, this camera, the digital camera. And if, if you listen, oh, you hear that zoom? That You remember, you remember those cameras? Yeah, maybe some of you remember your grandmother's having those cameras, right? Every Easter, every Christmas, right? That, that was the sound of grandma taking her pictures. Ah, just amazing. And I, and I love this camera. And uh, for anyone who's pretty much 12 years and under, you have no idea what we're, what we're talking about now, how there's, there's film in the back, right? And, and you would take the pictures, and then you'd have to wait if you were, you know, Blessed financially, you could get your pictures back in 48 hours, but otherwise you had to wait, you know, to get them in often a week. I found a photo album. Again, if you're 12 years or you're younger, you probably have no idea what that is. So it's a book where we would put pictures in, and then we could look at them. And your parents probably have it at your grandparents' house, and, you know, there's some pictures of your parents when they were little in there. And I found a book. I have a photo album of some of my favorite shots that I thought were so cool uh, when I had this little camera when I was little. And um, there's a reason I didn't bring it to show you uh, today. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was my, you know, I love taking pictures with that. I think the attraction to taking pictures is that you're freezing a moment of time. And, and you're holding on to that experience. You're holding on to the feelings associated with that moment. And you want it to last last as long as you can. Uh, so, of course, we didn't stop there. And then, oh, oh, and then <laughs> my grandma got a digital camera a couple years ago, so she gave me her old one. See, you know, and the battery's dead in it, but this was the old, zzz, zzz, you know, every Christmas. And so that's, that's a nice little special camera there. Uh, and then I graduated to a digital camera. I was so excited. Got my first digital camera. And this was an amazing, amazing little camera. And to this day, it's hard to find a camera that takes as, as good of outdoor shots as this little Pentax thing. And for you kids, you probably don't understand how cool this was back like 15 years ago, okay? Because it was so tiny and it was waterproof. And you could take this in the water. And I loved it and I took it everywhere and I actually lost it uh, windsurfing on Jericho Beach in Vancouver. And I'd stuffed it into the the pocket of my wetsuit, and then I didn't wear the wetsuit for two years, and so I thought I'd lost it. Uh, yeah, so then I had to buy another camera, right? Because I lost that one, you know? So that, I love the pictures that that one took. And then I got my nice, nicer camera, you know? The, the, so, and again, these are so old. I'm sorry, guys, you have to look. It's like vintage stuff now. Um, yeah. Ooh, it still works. Yeah. And this one was great because this is the first camera that, that I had when I got, after we were married. And so there's a lot of pictures of us that we took with this, a lot of memories, a, lo a lot of things that we did in places that we traveled, and, and that captured a lot of it. But of course, that wasn't, you know, good enough to last for, for too long. And, uh, and then we got, oh, you guys are going to love this. You're going to love this one here. Check this out. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the original GoPro Hero. Does anyone know it? No? 
Okay. Well, this was really cool because you could take this and for the first time, you could do action sports and crash and not worry about destroying your camera. All right? So we took this bad boy, wakeboarding, uh, skiing, uh, everything. Everything you could do, we did with this bad boy. And you, I watch the footage now, and you get sick to your stomach because it's just shaking all over, and it's just crazy. But again, we're trying to capture these moments, these feelings, and make them last and last forever. And then finally, you know, we, we upgraded a bit to, to the point where I spent the money, and, and I got a decent camera when, when our little guy was born. And so I still kind of use this one today, but I still don't take as many as many shots as I should um, with it. But again, all this, all this time, all this investment to try and capture and hold on to a moment, well, it's really to leave something, to leave a, a legacy, if you want to call it that, but to leave something where you can look back and say, this is how the world looked to me. This is what I thought was important, and I hope it's valuable to you. So all of this investment that we make, you know, into capturing these moments, my favorite things to capture are the stars. I love astrophotography, and I am horrible at it. Just, I don't, don't, I'm not an artist. I I don't get it. A lot of our kids are in photography class, and I look at the pictures they take, and I'm very low-key jealous of them because it's just... You know, I've invested, right? And they're using these old, you know, DSLR cameras that we have at school, and they're getting these amazing shots. And, mm. A couple years ago, I was up in Yellowknife visiting Pastor Geraci and the church up there. And in the middle of winter, and in, if you've ever been to Yellowknife, they have these little lighthouses around the town that are on top of buildings and signs. And when the Aurora Borealis lights up, they flash green. And so you wait at night, and then you see the little lighthouses, and they flash green, and you grab your cameras, and you run outside, and you spend a couple minutes because it's freezing at night. And so that's what I did. I borrowed his car. I drove out onto the lake, and I took all these shots as the sky from horizon to horizon was green and pink and purple and dancing, and it's just vibrant, and you're so close to God. And I got back, and I looked at the photos of when I went to edit them, and there wasn't one good photo, and I was so mad and so frustrated because I didn't have a tripod. And if you've ever done any night photography, any, any slower speed photography, you know you can't do it without the tripod. What Adventist education is about is providing the opportunity for your students to take a picture, providing the opportunity for children to create something, to create an image, to create a story with their lives. But they need the tools to do it. Ellen White talks about this um, trinity, if you were, of the support for the student. You have your church your church family that seeks to raise as a community your children. You have your home, the home where you have your morning and evening worships. And then you have your church school where the teachers get up and teach all the subjects through the lens of Jesus and his patient love and mercy for us. And when one side is weak, the other side can support and help the other And all of these three work together to hold up the student as they seek to create a story for themselves, as they seek to create an eternal legacy, not just for this life, but for the life to come. All three working together to have this image, to create an image that will hopefully reveal who Jesus is. So the question then becomes, what is the purpose of your life? What is the image that you are trying to create? What is the image that we are trying to help our students to create? We live in a culture right now where everything, the entire worldview, is about making yourself happy. 
Do whatever it takes by any means necessary to make yourself happy. In fact, it is immorally, it is immoral and wrong for you not to be happy. Therefore, anything that doesn't make you happy is immoral and wrong. And that can only be based on your feelings, and what you think is right. And so that's why we have, we have all these things like you got to have a side hustle, right? You got to have something going. You got to, you, you guys should all be investing in cryptocurrency, right? That's, no? I think cryptocurrency is currently the essential oils, but it's for men. If you know what I mean, right? Like, we're not going to go down, down that road, but you know what I'm saying? Everything has got to be, you got to find a way to make a little extra coin to get what you need to be secure and to be happy. And, and in the midst of all that, while well, those ideas are what are trying to support and hold up our young people, we come along as a church, as a home, as, as a church school, and we say, hold on. Maybe, maybe there's a different way that we can support you in creating an image, a picture for yourself under the way that Jesus wants. In Matthew... If you want to turn to this, Matthew 16, and I know we all know these words very well. This is Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus is again talking to his disciples 2,000 years ago, and he's talking, I believe, to us today. If any of you wants to be my follower, Jesus says, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul in the process? Is anything worth more than your soul? For I, the Son of Man, will come in the glory of my Father with his angels and will judge all people according to their deeds. Is anything worth more than your soul? At the beginning, when I, when I talked about Paul standing, and you, read those, you heard those words of Paul standing as the chief of sinners, living in God's grace and patient mercy, as a demonstration, as an example to people, That's why our example, your example, your life, your legacy is is so much bigger than just your own story. Because you sit here, you stand at the back, you talk to others, you interact with the children. And as a community, we show them that there is more to life than just being happy in this moment. There is a grace for our failings. There is a hope for our sadness. There is joy in the midst of utter pain and utter sorrow because today and this life is not the whole story. The whole story is is still being written. And I hope your legacy and my legacy is that when we get to heaven, we can look back and we can see all of the ways and all of the people who interacted with us and how we guided and we were an example to them of Jesus, his grace, and his patient mercy that they too may be saved. To that end, I believe it's so important to honor those who have given so much to make their legacy a part of my legacy. I mean, as, as I look around this room and as I think of Central Church in particular, I, I would not be standing here today if it wasn't for Central Church. Pastor Mel DeCowage, who baptized my parents. The people who were friends, Elder Bob Ramsey and, and his wife. The teachers at Coralwood, Mr. Ferris. How many people here have skated on Mr. Ferris's hockey rink? Anybody? Yeah? Some of you? That was the best part of recess. And you'd come back in and you'd have bloody knees under your jeans, you know, because you'd fall on the ice and stuff. That was just amazing. The library that Mrs. Ferris ran where I first discovered the Little House on the Prairie books. Yes, they're a cool book series, guys. Uh, they're <laughs> the, the joy of learning 
Learning from Mrs. Linda Stanky. Ah, bless her soul, Bunty Naherney. And I can go on, I can list all these names. Even Mrs. Popek taught me in, in, in grade 11 and 12. And I know I'm not the only one. That's just a very tiny snapshot of the people here who have blessed my story. So I want you to think. I want you to remember. Think back to the people, the teachers, the, the support staff, the Sabbath school teachers, the, the seniors at the back after church who would come up to you and give you some Werther's Originals or just say they were so happy to see you. I will never forget people like that. Mrs. Mary and Orville Nix, who would just let us know that they were praying for us. And what a difference that made in my journey through, through being a teenager into university. People made a difference. You make a difference in the lives of the people around you, but especially of the children. So I encourage you, if you see someone who's made a difference in your life, Thank them. Reach out to them. Now you have so many opportunities through technology to just reach out and, and say thank you for what you've done, for making your legacy a part of my legacy. As the choir gets ready to, to come on up and, and sing our closing song, I want to leave you with these words from Jesus, this idea from Jesus that what makes Adventist education truly unique is that we are doing this together. We are sinners, saved by grace, learning to become disciples of Jesus, growing towards his kingdom. And as we do that, we are making a difference for eternity, whether in the Sabbath school rooms, whether in the foyer, whether at home, whether at church school, whether at public school. I think of the witness of people like Mrs. Diane Hedgecock, who spent her career serving others in the public system. And I know many of you attend public schools, and you are witnesses to Jesus there, and you are living the life God has called you to live. So I encourage you, create the pictures. Create the pictures that when people look at, will lead them to say, hey, you know Jesus. Has Jesus made a difference in your life? Maybe he can make a difference in my life too.
I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith. As a result of having these strong roots in love, I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width, its length, its height, and its depth, together with all believers. I ask that you will know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge, so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God to his glory for all eternity. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, thank you, Coralwood Choir, for coming. And uh, we just ask that uh, we give a couple moments for those in the balcony to leave, uh, if they choose to so do, and uh, out through there, and then our deacons will dismiss us here on the front. Thank you and go with Jesus.